Hi there, it's Amanda Pratt with Imagine Life Therapy, and I'm the chronic illness therapist. Today, we're going to talk about what to do when you have to find a new doctor. This week, I had to start seeing another rheumatologist. I have been living with uh, a diagnosis of an overlap of lupus and RA, uh, fibromyalgia, as well as endometriosis and some other random diagnoses like hypothyroidism, trigger finger, and periarticular osteopenia or thinning of the bones uh, in my hands. I had been previously seeing a rheumatologist for about three years and she was treating me for uh, both lupus and RA and my fibromyalgia was pretty well managed so we didn't really need to attend to that as much. This week I had to start seeing a new rheumatologist because when I made the decision to quit my last job and start my own private practice, I lost my insurance through them and the doctor's office, even though they filled out my FMLA paperwork and encouraged me to leave my job because the stress of it was making my blood work uh, and my lupus much worse, they failed to tell me that I would be losing them as a specialist because they don't take patients who don't have insurance. I didn't know this until I showed up for my next appointment and sat there waiting for 30 minutes only to be told that I couldn't see them. So it was pretty upsetting the way that they handled it. I think that they know they didn't handle it very well, uh, but I had to move on from there. I immediately started calling some other rheumatologists but found in my search that uh, the rheumatologists in my area will disqualify you um, from their patient list if you have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia anywhere in your history, which I found to be interesting. And it may be that they don't know how to treat it, which is okay, uh, but to deny someone who also has a diagnosis of lupus based on that, I find to be highly problematic. After doing that search and coming up empty-handed, I kind of just stopped searching. Recently, I've had some flares that kind of got to the point where I felt like I needed more support than my uh, primary care physician could provide, and I decided I need to start back up my search for rheumatologists. It brought up a lot of things that I'm sure a lot of you can identify with. So I wanted to create a post about what to do when switching doctors, what to look for, and why certain aspects of this are important. Why does a diagnosis matter? Why does a specific diagnosis matter? And sometimes people will find that when they find a new doctor, the new doctor will actually say, I don't believe you ever had this diagnosis. And I find this to be true, especially for rheumatology, because a lot of the diagnoses that we might get are very subjective in nature. Every doctor has their own opinion. They have their own way of doing things, uh, their own belief systems, their own biases and they also might see more of a certain type of illness in their practice and therefore they're more likely to see it due to the frequency bias which uh, we know I did another video on that and sometimes I think doctors will just have their brain primed to see a certain illness and then they diagnose it that more or therefore might exclude another illness because they don't see it as much and that can be a problem. So the reason diagnosis matters is because num first and foremost, it directs our treatment. If I have a diagnosis of lupus, they're going to be looking at specific treatments for lupus or like illnesses, and that does matter. It allows us to have access to certain resources we might need. If you're at a job and you need to file for FMLA, they're gonna ask you what your diagnosis is and what the characteristics or symptoms of that are that might be distressing to you at work. And if you don't have an official diagnosis or your doctor isn't willing to uh, back up this diagnosis for you, it could be hard for you to get the resources or accommodations you need. It offers an explanation for us and allows us to communicate better with other people around us. It's easier to say, sorry, I can't go out and do that right now. I have lupus and it doesn't allow me to, than it is to say, um, I have these general symptoms and we're not really sure what it is, but I just am not feeling well. Sometimes people will be more responsive 
to knowing what the diagnosis is that you can very clearly and confidently say. It helps you navigate the world e a little easier. And the other thing is it, it helps you start to make sense of what might be happening in your body. And that helps our emotional state. If we're in a state of limbo where we don't know what's going on, it can really start to feel like you're going crazy. Are these symptoms real? You're questioning yourself, you're questioning your body, and that really can do a number on you emotionally. Why does it matter then to have a certain type of specialist, some people might ask. Why have a rheumatologist versus a primary care doctor? I think this is important because again, back to uh, the same reasoning for why a diagnosis matters is it directs your treatment. Certain specialists will have access to or special knowledge of treatments specific to your illness that primary care doctors either might not know about or they might not have access to. We're gonna have a higher than average knowledge on certain diagnoses and so they might be aware of certain complexities of your illness, how it can present, um, what treatments work better for certain people at certain ages, uh, things to look out for in terms of progression of your illness, and that's all important. How do we know if a provider is the one for us? One thing I like to tell people is remember, you are a consumer of your own health care. So you're shopping around to find a provider. You don't necessarily have to go to the first one that takes you. While it can be hard and costly to shop around, it's definitely worth it to have a good relationship with whatever provider you're seeing at the time. One of the things to look for is, when you're seeing this provider, do they validate your concerns? Do they accept the symptoms that you tell them and do they feel like they're real and they take it seriously. That's always the most important thing. Do they ask probing questions or do they just kind of accept what you say? We don't necessarily want a provider to doubt what we're saying, but we definitely want them to ask more questions. When you have the symptom, how does it present? What things trigger it? What is your environment like when you're having these symptoms? How often does it happen? We want them to be gathering as much knowledge as possible on your symptoms so that they can be aware of everything that's happening. We want a provider who asks about our lifestyle. How are you eating? How are you sleeping? What type of activity do you get? What is your stress level like? And what types of things are you doing to cope with your symptoms? I think it's good always that they ask these questions because there could be some environmental thing happening that they can screen for and say, actually, you know, I, I'm aware of this type of thing causing symptoms like this, that might lead them to screen for another type of illness that you hadn't thought of before. So it's always important that they ask questions about your environment and your lifestyle, what you do for a living, etc. We want doctors that are free from biases. So if your doctor seems like they are leaning toward a specific philosophy or leaning toward a certain belief system, um, you know, especially when it comes to fibromyalgia, some specialists don't even believe that it's a thing. They don't believe it's real or they don't believe that we have enough evidence to support that it's something they should take seriously and actually treat. And it's important to make sure that your provider is literate and accepting of all of these different things. Are they willing to collaborate with other providers you have? If you have a neurologist, if you have a mental health therapist, are they willing to collaborate on treatment so that everyone is communicating together for your best interest? Are they interested in the full history of your health? If you come in and you provide them with uh, test records that you have that may be irrelevant to your initial diagnosis, um, test records that show how you respond to certain treatments in the past. If they're not willing to look at any of that, that's usually a big red flag that that's a problem. Um, I've had doctors who weren't willing to look at anything and they ended up not being good providers. They ended up not believing me. They ended up actually dismissing me and walking out of the office. So I've had some pretty uh, terrible experiences, which I know a lot of you also have had and those are always red flags this is not the provider for me they're not gonna help me and I need to find someone else what are some things that you can do to help make this experience better and offer them 
objective measures of what's happening with you. Number one, I always recommend that you track your symptoms. So because I'm seeing a new rheumatologist now and I know that she's gonna wanna start all my blood work over and she's gonna wanna start tracking things for herself, even though I haven't done it in a few years, I have started tracking my symptoms again so she can see what's happening in an objective way with data that I gather over time. You can do this using apps, you can use a journal to do this, but it's important that you track your symptoms and lifestyle choices so that they can see where you're at. This is also great because if they decide to add in a new treatment for you, this can also track progress of your treatment and see whether or not it's working for you. Even small improvements can be good and sometimes we don't notice small improvements like we do big ones uh, unless, unless we track it. You can also ask your loved ones, uh, people close to you, friends, family for input. How do you think I've been doing lately? Uh, what do you think is my worst symptom? What do I do when I'm having a flare? Uh, what types of things do you notice about my behavior that I might not notice? You can also ask them to come to a session with you so that they can offer their input and their observations to your doctor and be part of your care as well. Be honest with your history. Uh, if there's anything that comes up that you're concerned about, let them know. I'm kind of nervous sharing this with you, but this is something that's part of my history. This is why I'm nervous sharing it with you. Uh, I wanna make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, sometimes people are nervous about sharing mental health history information because sometimes providers can say, oh, well, you have depression. I think your symptoms are better explained that they're as a result of your depression. Um, let them know, you know, I've had depression in the past, but I have explored that this is a result of my symptoms and not my symptoms being a result of that. I have consulted with a mental health professional, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and again, if they don't take these things seriously, then that's not the provider for you. Or if they dismiss your symptoms based on you sharing this information, then that's not the provider for you. And last and most important, if you disagree with something that your provider is doing or something they say or a treatment they have or a philosophy they have, speak up, let them know. Uh, sometimes just saying that gives them an opportunity to say, okay, well, I'm willing to be open to what your views are about this certain treatment or let's try something else. But if you don't speak up, it doesn't give them an opportunity to kind of shift gears. And if you speak up and they still disregard your values or your beliefs about a certain thing, then that's another red flag to find another provider. I hope this helped you. Again, um, I'm still going through the process of working with this provider and deciding if they're the one for me. I don't feel like I quite have enough information yet, but as I go through that journey, I'll share any insights I have with you that I think would be helpful. I hope you all have a great week and feel free to comment below if you have any tips or tricks that you've used when uh, switching providers what's worked, what hasn't, um, and let us know so we can all learn from your experience as well. Don't forget also to subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the bell notification so you'll be notified if I post any future videos. Again, this is Amanda Pratt, licensed clinical social worker and therapist with Imagine Life Therapy.